Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Richard Herskowitz, director of the Ashland Independent Film Festival, and this is day three. And this is the second of our two talkbacks on the, a larger theme of activist film uh, in our festival this year. I hope some of you made it to the amazing talkback we had uh, yesterday. Uh, and yes, um, we saw that, uh, you know, there have been weather issues around the country and uh, we lost a few filmmakers and moderators and we managed to bring in uh, Sonia Childress yesterday who moderated the panel, if you weren't here, uh, on Skype on these two um, screens. Uh, she was supposed to be on this panel as well, um, but um, this time um, uh, it, it wasn't possible to bring her in. But we do have uh, somebody else from Firelight Media, somebody who was uh, um, in the doc lab, and you're gonna see a little bit of her work today. So added to the names that you have on your sheets, we have Chelsea Hernandez at the end. So I wanna thank her for coming. Um, so, um, I mean, one of the things that uh, we have attempted to do to um, um, you know, make these talkbacks uh, uh, particularly strong and effective is bring in uh, very capable, talented moderators. Um, and uh, Sonia performed that role yesterday. Today, I'm thrilled that we were able to bring here from the Bay Area, Carrie Lozano. Um, Carrie is um, now the director of the new um, uh, Enterprise Documentary Fund that gives up to $100,000 production grants to uh, filmmakers, and that's part, uh, again, of the International Documentary Association. Uh, before that, she had um, been a, um, a producer, a senior producer of the um, Al Jazeera America's Peabody-winning investigative series, Fault Line, and she also produced the Academy Award-nominated The Weather Underground. So, please now. I will turn things over to our moderator, Carrie Lozano. Thank you, good morning, and thanks for the shout out to Weather Underground, it's been a long time. Um, so I'm so delighted to be here, thank you Richard, T thank you to the festival, you've been incredible hosts, and thank you to our panelists. Um, this is a really exciting and, and interesting conversation to be having now, and I've had it a few times in the last few months about where does documentary film fit in the current political landscape? And um, every time we have the conversation, my feelings evolve, and I'm sure for all of you, your feelings have evolved as well. So I think you have everybody's information and bio, and you can see our names, and I just wanna hop in. We have a hard out. We have to be out of here at 11.30, and I really want them to discuss uh, the issues at hand, and I want you to ask your questions. So we're gonna jump right in. Chelsea Hernandez, um, down there at the end of our table is a Firelight Lab filmmaker. She's making a feature film as part of the lab about undocumented construction workers. And she was tapped to um, make a short as well as part of a series called 100 Days. So Chelsea, uh, we're gonna kick off by seeing six minutes of that um, and then go to our discussion. Chelsea, can you set up the 100 Days project and also your film for us? Sure. Um, our 100 Days is a new initiative um, with Firelight Media TV, which was co-founded by Marsha Smith and Stanley Nelson, who uh, directed um, the Black Panther, uh, the Black Panthers, um, that was aired on PBS, um, and um, with Field of Vision, which is a media platform um, for short documentaries um, run by AJ Schnack and Laura Poitras. And so this new initiative um, was a way to bring in filmmakers of color to make short films about social issues um, and kind of deepen the understanding of the impact of um, communities um, that are dealing with um, the, the political climate that's occurring right now. Um, and so I was able to do a short um, that's still actually in post-production right now, so we're only showing about six minutes. Um, and I followed two pregnant women, one's undocumented and one's married to an undocumented um, person and um, it's based in Austin, Texas and recently we had a whole bunch of ICE raids in retaliation to our sheriff who was who had announced that she was not going to cooperate with ICE anymore. Um, and so this is just a preview. Um, it's not color corrected or sound mix, so pardon that um, the 
semi bad audio, um, but there are subtitles on it. It's um, spoken in Spanish and English. Tengo 21 años viviendo aquí en Austin y soy de Nuevo León, México. Yo uh, trabajaba limpiando casas por casi cuatro años. Ahora estoy embarazada de mi cuarto hijo. Pues estamos feliz por nuestro próximo bebé y que es una niña. Pero a la, a la vez este, triste o preocupada por tantos cambios que ha habido en el país con la política. Yo y mi esposo, los dos somos indocumentados, pues todos vamos a estar en el peligro de que nos deporten en cualquier momento. The day after the election, I felt afraid in a way I'd never felt before. I'm half white and half Mexican. My mother is dark skinned and my dad is white. I'd never been afraid of white people before. But the day after the election, I felt afraid going into grocery stores, feeling like, are you one of them that wants to rip apart my family? I came here when I was eight, and my parents brought me to this country to give me something I didn't have, which was education. And so I guess that's when I found out that what being undocumented in this country meant was like you couldn't live the same experiences as any other human being or any other child that I grew up with. I'm always at the mercy of somebody coming and grabbing me and deporting me to Mexico. After the election, I dreamt that there were vigilante groups going door to door in our neighborhood. And my son was born and I was holding him in my arms and I was hiding my husband in like the floorboards. Apenas días atrás estaban, este, estaban preguntándome de qué de que se trataba lo de Ciudad de Santuario y como mi hijo más chico, este, como escucha que el muro y que el muro y que sí lo van a hacer y entonces él me estaba preguntando que por qué era eso y que sí lo van a hacer o no. Ellos dicen, este, a nosotros también nos van a llevar, entonces pues le decimos que que ellos pues son nacidos aquí, ¿verdad? que nosotros pues somos los que um, tenemos el peligro. Como su abuelo es este residente, entonces decimos aquí va a estar él, les va a cocinar, él les va a cuidar. pues es preocupante y, y que ellos, o sea, también se estén preocupando por algo que, que no debería de ser. Ellos deberían de estar este, felices, yendo a la escuela, a preocupándose por sus cosas de su edad.
meses atrás estaba preocupada de uh, como ya había escuchado aquí en Austin que uh, los bebés que estaban haciendo no les estaban permitiendo sacar su acta de nacimiento entonces pensaba que cuando ella le tocara nacer a lo mejor podría tener el mismo problema por todos los um, cambios en la política y porque ganó Trump um, ahorita todavía no se ha escuchado nada espero bueno, tener problemas pero era una bueno y es todavía una cosa de la que me preocupa Yo no sabía antes que podías entrar al Capitolio y este, poder andar ahí. Thank you, Chelsea, for showing that. It, it's really interesting to think about um, in the lead up to the election that. I think we're finding there was a lot of rhetoric and kind of empty threats, but that the immigration issue was actually something that was sincere and that is being acted on um, in a very big way and perhaps in, in kind of the most immediate way um, we can think about. And so I'm curious, Chelsea, for you, um, in your feature film and in this film, how much are you thinking about um, the consequences of your participants in the film and, and how is that being handled and, and how is it impacting your work? Well, I got a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, these two women, um, I actually know through my feature that I'm working on. Um, and so the, um, the woman who's having her first child, um, who's half white, half um, Mexican, she is um, an organizer, and so she's been running like an organization for a while in Texas, helping undocumented workers. Um, so she's um, she's pretty out there and very involved, and she's empowered a pretty big immigrant community in Austin, um, which Ruth, the other woman, um, she has helped empower her. So um, it's been interesting because I think um, sometimes we think that immigrants are kind of still trying to hide, and, and there are many who are, but I think now um, they're starting to um, just being reinvigorated because they're just fed up with you know the racism and um, mm. the the things that they've been dealing with for years that they're ready to to stand up and um, Ruth knows a lot about the law um, probably more than I do and um, she's just a really powerful woman and so she's there on the front lines um, I mean one thing that gets a little tricky is um, when I meet undocumented um, people, when I get them to sign a release form, um, that gets a little mm -hmm. awkward because they don't want to leave their address or their phone number with me. Um, but I've gained enough trust, I think, in the community um, that they they trust me. But I think if an outsider came in, it would be a little bit more difficult. Um, but these are things that I think a lot of documentary filmmakers are thinking about now as well. Um, is what if Trump passes something and could use my movies as evidence that these people are undocumented, 
and um, come after me um, for that evidence. So um, starting to think about that and the plans of what to do if something like that came about, and um, my lawyer's been very helpful <laughs> with that. Good, good. Kirby, I'm just going to kind of come down the table, and then what I want to do is just throw out questions that become much more of a, a discussion and possibly a debate. I mean, you've been making films for a long time that take on really powerful institutions the US military, very powerful Ivy League universities. I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, is it a different time now? Do we have different considerations and, and do we have different responsibilities? Well, I think yes and no. Um, I think one of the differences that is interesting is I think that um, there was, a, I, you know, I think some people within the documentary film community had created a hierarchy around films where pushing political films down the, down the list where films that were more art films or more cinematic were considered somehow more filmic. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, which I think was a kind of a ridiculous perspective because, I mean, if they were criticizing it from the perspective of art, well, art is completely inclusive. Every subject should be a... Every, all subject matter should be, you know, fair game for art. And so it was actually an anti-art position. Of course, you saw that change immediately after the election. So that's one good thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I, I think the other thing is, I mean, I think we have to be, you know, careful to overreact to just electoral politics because politics mm -hmm. is going on well beyond electoral politics mm -hmm. and has been for a long, long time. And so. I think filmmakers who are thinking about this don't necessarily have to think of their films as related to Trump or anti-Trump. And in fact, I think they should be careful because I think there might be, although I mean, I encourage, you know, I encourage filmmakers to think the entire range of subject matter, but I don't think you necessarily want to rush into just that kind of uh, orientation. I mean, you might, you know, as a filmmaker, you may have been working in something that there's the po politics is in everything. So I think one should be careful not just to overreact to this situation. Yeah. Brian, speaking yeah. of. Um, <laughs> so speaking of overreacting. If you, to yeah, uh, not, overrea not overreacting, but, <laughs> but um, if you haven't seen it, please try to go see Nobody Speak. Is there another screening during today, this festival? Today at uh, 12 o'clock. So it, it's a film about the demise of Gawker and Peter Thiel's involvement um, in the bankruptcy of, of the media company. Yes, exactly. And Brian, but you were, I mean, you hopped on this story before any of us thought that mm. it was even a possibility that Trump could be president, yeah. right? I mean, you've been grappling with these types of issues of power um, for a very long time. And I guess I'm wondering, but at the same time, as you were wrapping the film, you pulled the Trump narrative into your film. Mm. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how you're seeing the landscape and how you're feeling about your work. And do you feel like this is a more dangerous time to be doing the work that you do? Because I think that was our, in terms of reacting, I think that was our initial reaction. It was like, oh, we're screwed. How are we going to do this work? How do you feel about that right now? Uh, well, we fall into the media <laughs> or the press or independent uh, voices. So uh, Trump you know, banked a lot of his rise on uh, attacking uh, those voices. And, and what we've seen in the last year is really a questioning of what's real, what's true. Um, so uh, we're all wrapped up in that. Um, I took Trump very, very seriously. Um, he was actually in my film right from the beginning. Uh, I saw the similarities between this bizarre trial happening and simmering in this courtroom in Florida. And um, certainly when it was revealed that Peter Thiel was behind, um, uh, the, the money of Peter Thiel was behind this secretly. Uh, we also, in, this, in, the, uh, in the documentary, cover the uh, secretive purchase of the Las Vegas Review Journal by Sheldon Adelson. So this way that l money is leveraging these basic kind of constitutional rights. Um, but Trump was, uh, I could never separate those stories from, the, from this bizarre political rise of this person who just attacked uh, free, free speech um, at every turn and demonized the media and this, uh, you could feel something was afoot here um, that was very dangerous. Now whether we're da more or less dangerous um, is an interesting question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, surveillance um, in some of the other films we, we look at that and, uh, and, and protesting against it and I think what those of us who cared about that issue often said, well, what if someone crazy comes and gets, the, gets in charge and gets the, the steering wheel? And, you know, and, as that debate raged on, a lot of times we're like, well, we kind of basically trust our government was, was the point. Well, 
now what? Uh, so now that that's happened, I think we're gonna have, we're gonna sort of sort through that. The protection of sources is very critical. Um, under Obama, we saw attacks on journalists too, uh, using the Espionage Act. We we saw bizarre things like the FBI posing as journalists and sending malware to get to subjects and stuff, uh, acting as journalists. We saw a whole bunch of things using new technology that were threatening to journalists. So, if you trust Obama. <laughs> And now, now all of that stuff is in the hands of Trump, uh, who is clearly um, uh, uh, ha has uh, has uh, demagogue tendencies <laughs> in that regard. Um, you know, I think I think uh, we have to watch it. I mean, he, he, right now it seems like he's just a little disorganized uh, and a little chaotic. So maybe the uh, fear, you know, right now <laughs> as we speak, it isn't great, but. You know, we've seen in the last two weeks, for instance, um, anonymous uh, Twitter yeah. accounts I'll ask you about that. Um, that were critical of Trump. Uh, you, we've seen the Trump administration go after them and try to uncover who that was. Luckily, in that case, Twitter had a backbone. They sued the government and they won, and Trump backed off. You might have missed that, and there's some other insane things happening yeah. in our planet. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I think we. Journalism. I'm a little optimistic. I think journalists have have uh, there's legitimate criticism of journalism that it has gotten too cozy to power, that it's been corporatized, um, and I think that there's nothing like a common enemy to understand what you were there for in the first place. So I think that there, we're seeing a kind of um, uh, what she, she, Chelsea mentioned reinvigorated. I think maybe. Uh, that could be a positive aspect, a reinvigorated press, adversarial press that questions power. Colin, your film, What Lies Upstream, is also here at the festival. When is that screening? Uh, it's tonight at 6 o'clock and then tomorrow at 9.30. And so the film covers um, a water contamination event in West Virginia due to um, some of the coal mining that was happening there and chemicals that ended up in the water. This happened in 2014, I believe. Um, we did a story actually at Fault Lines when that happened. It, it preceded um, uh, the Flint story that we all know so well, but this one got much less attention than Flint in so many ways. And I guess I'm wondering, and so you're, you're investigating what happened and you, um, you come up with a pretty bleak uh, <laughs> discovery, which is that nobody really wants to know the truth, or at least that's how, I, how I, I, my takeaway from it is that, or, or they don't want the public to know the truth. Um, and they don't, they are putting big business over um, the health of the citizens. And so you insert yourself and you are investigating and, and trying to understand how this could be and whether or not the water is safe. Talk a little bit about um, what's happened since and what, if I, I know your film just premiered in January, but, but what is, what is, been the kind of latest in their plight, and how does your film play into that? Right, so when you're talking about something like, you said before uh, that they don't really want the truth to be revealed. Um, and, and it's interesting, I think we're seeing something at the national level play out that I saw play out in West Virginia, which is sort of the centerpiece, the case study that I use in the film. Um, and, and that is, th there's this sort of unabashed recklessness. Um, so when you say, you know, that they don't want the truth, I think actually they're so open with it now in a way, mm. they don't even care showing the relationship yeah. uh, mm. between the corporate, I mean, the people who used to run these corporations are now literally running, uh, you know, the various departments. So this is what happened in West Virginia. Uh, we, we saw uh, there was really no firewall between the corporations there and, and the government. And when I was filming there, I was thinking, gosh, maybe this is just a West Virginia problem. Um, mm. And, I, and I, uh, there was this uh, a brilliant scholar um, who studies Appalachian uh, history. And what he said was, you know, West Virginia is a reflection of what America is, is about to become. Mm. Um, and uh, at the time, I was like, well, that's an interesting theory. <laughs> uh, and yet, he here we find ourselves. So, um, so in, that, in that sense, uh, they're not necessarily covering up their relationship to um, you know, money anymore. Um, what, what I did see, what I do see covered up there is, is and, and continues to be covered up at, at the national level, is anything that could be perceived as uh, bad news for them 
anything that could be a crisis, anything that could come back to harm them, uh, they're dismissive of, they'll lie about, they'll cover up. And this is what I saw uh, time and time again in West Virginia, and I had the good fortune. Um, one of the nice things at the state level is you can get access in a way you can't at the federal level. And so I was able to get in with all of the top regulators in the state, um, you know, somebody who runs the Department of Environmental Health there. Um, I follow a character who starts as, as the head of the local health department and then he rises um, over the course of the film. And uh, we see how the system really uh, changes people. I mean, I think we all imagine we're sitting in the room and we're like, well, if we were put in a position of power, we would really do things different. And what it seems, what seems to play itself out over and over again is that the system ends up changing us when we get into it, not, mm -hmm. not the other way around. And, um, and that's really what the other thing I was, I was seeing there. So, and, and then when that happens, and I think you get in one of these positions of power, um, y you, um, you start to justify things. You justify why you need to hide certain truths um, so that you can maybe achieve other uh, goals. And, uh, and, and this becomes a real problem. I mean, this, this goes back to the issue that I think um, both Brian and I care about a lot, which is transparency um, and transparency in government. And, and why is there transparency you know, uh, for the citizens? Why is there this sort of expectation of we should share everything, but the government um, sh should not? And so, uh, and that's one of the things we see here time and time again is this people sort of rise on this notion of transparency, that they'll be the one to reveal the truth to us, and then when they get in this position of power, suddenly they hold every, all the facts close to their chest. Um, and I would love nothing more than to see a government official actually be transparent, because it would be not only refreshing, but it would restore faith in democracy. Right. Well, this is, I mean, one of the things that I've really grappled with in the last few months is, has anything really changed, or we just do we just now kind of really know what's going on mm -hmm. because they're not hiding it anymore? And you know, and I go back and forth. But one thing that feels like it's changed, and this is for any or, or all of you, is that you know there was a moment where this idea of fake news was like scandalous, right? Jason Blair at the New York Times, huge scandal. Swift Boat, huge scandal. You know, Mitt Romney says one thing in a recording, and that's over for him. And so. What the hell is happening? Like, why is that not happening anymore? Can, you know, can any of you explain this? <laughs> <laughs> Kirby, come on. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm just, you know, I, I mean, this is the thing that I can't, I'm just really trying to understand is like, what has happened? I think of this Mr. Burns <laughs> Simpsons episode where he has so many diseases that he can't actually get sick. <laughs> they're, all, they're all trying to get through. <laughs> that's, that's what it feels like to me, yeah. <laughs> I, I have one take on this. Um, my, and this is my, my way of looking at it. There's, you know, fake news has always been with us forever. I bet you if you went back to the first election uh, between two people, one of them was saying false things about the other to get elected. Um, it's always been a part of things. Um, and fake news by itself is a very weird term that we have to be very careful about because, um, of course, Trump uses it to describe the New York Times. So this is something that he's just snatched out of the air and used as a weapon. Um, but if you think about the, um, the disinformation beast that fueled the Trump phenomenon, that is a multi-headed monster. Um, maybe its teeth and public facing part is Breitbart and all these conservative sites and social media and a social media strategy that involves bots and all that stuff, but it's being fed by other groups. It's being fed by dark groups behind the scenes, um, outside political groups that have a particular political agenda. And their job really is to come up with stories, either made up <laughs> or true, um, that support a political viewpoint. And we don't know what that comes from. Uh, we don't know what we don't know almost anything about them. Talk about transparent, n almost nothing about these dark groups. Um, a perfect example of this is the Government Accountability Project in Florida, which is run by Mar Robert Mercer. Robert Mercer mm -hmm. saved Breitbart News after Andrew Breitbart okay. died. He gave us Bannon, he gave us Kellyanne Conway, he gave us Flynn, he gave us Trump as the president. Um, this was a highly well-funded <coughs> thing, very much in the dark. And the Government Accountability Project created real stories, uh, genuine journalism on Clinton Cash. And that's, those stories appeared in the New York Times. So one thing, this is my take, I think not enough people are talking about the, the combination or the, the 
relationship between something like Citizens United, which right. flew open the floodgates to these groups. That's when the money started flowing. And this thing that we're calling fake news, um, there may be, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a supporter of br a broad range of things, including th hate speech and things I don't like. Um, I'm, uh, I do think that we have protections in our society against, um, you know, libel laws and things that, that in which truth should, should, should be a kind of golden armor. Um, but what we don't know is all of these kind of dark money. When things went from being very wealthy individuals went from being having a limited amount of money they can spend on these groups to being an unlimited amount. Remember, this is a speech issue too. So, uh, since she's denied it is. So that's what we're not talking about. And, you know, there's no solution to false stories being printed. But there is a, so there is a solution to campaign finance and uh, being, tra you know, go back to the first election, there's bad things being said about the other candidate, but go back in our history. We, we also believe in transparency in political advertising. You know, this message has been approved by John McCain. Mm -hmm. So I think solving that would do a lot to solve the, the, the really dark parts of it. I have a question for you, Kirby, about the impact we can have. So <clears throat> with Invisible War, that really did change, at least on paper and in theory, I don't know what the reality is right now, um, the way the military uh, approaches sexual assault. And can you tell us a little bit about the background of how that happened? You know, how did the film get in front of the right people? How were, you know, at least, um, publicly hearts and minds changed or, or, or provoked into doing something, and could that happen today? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there was real change. I mean, I think that there's, as you can see, just from covering the news, there's a lot more that, that needs to be done. Um, but of course, you know, you can't rely on a documentary to change everything. I mean, it's, right. uh, you know, all political change is very much a collective over a long, long period of time. Um, what we did is, there's a couple of kind of strategies we used, um, which is we, we made it very nonpartisan. We had as many Republicans as Democrats in the film, which allowed us to get this to members of Congress and to uh, people in the military, and they, they not necessarily see it as coming from one side. The other thing we were very careful uh, about in the film is that we did not want this film to uh, just broadly attack the military. And in some ways, we got that direction subtly and, and also directly from our subjects. I mean, they all, all these subjects who'd been, you know, horribly raped in the military and, and the military had completely tried to cover it up. All these subjects, I mean, they were, when we were shooting them, they were wearing, you know, uh, sweatshirts with, you know, their branch on. I mean, it was just, it was such a strange uh, disconnect, but it's because they love the military, and there is a lot to love about the military. So I, th I, I, think it's v I think it's important to be careful not to position yourself as coming from uh, just a very aggressive, I mean, no, wait, let me back up. People can make any kind of film they want to, and I, I, I think that that's, and I encourage that. I don't, I don't want to go there. But, but in terms of political change, one should be thinking about that. And, and thinking of that, there, there is a balance, there's a, a plus and a minus to coming from completely from the outside and critiquing as opposed to thinking how you're going to position it vis-a-vis -vis power. Um, but I think that's a calculation and an analysis that should be made while filmmakers are making their film. And so in this case, I, you know, I think it, uh, it, it really did have an impact. The, the other thing I'd like to say is, and again, it's, it's sort of going back to this issue of maybe not just focusing on Trump. I mean, we chose uh, this issue of rape in the military because no one was covering it. Right. And, and as filmmakers, you know, you have an advantage if you go into an area where nobody is talking about anything because they just, the, the, the oppositions haven't been framed and you can come in with an analysis that in some way becomes the reference point. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I, I, as important as it is to try to sort of dissect how you can make films that you know, interact with our current political situation. I think it's also important to realize our current political situation is something that's been ongoing, that's developed for over 30 or 40 or 50 years, and you can look outside for, for issues that may relate but not directly relate to this very, you know, this debate. Right. 
There was a really interesting article that many of you may have seen in the New York Times recently about the kind of left-leaning liberal bias of documentary film and you know we seek right right leaning filmmakers and it was it was it was actually pretty controversial within the community um because for for a number of reasons um but you know i'm wondering it's like you know chelsea are you going into this thinking about right left politics when you um cover you know undocumented individuals in this country um yeah when i'm um in working with um, the construction industry in Texas, which is very um, right wing. Um, I did want to show both sides so that um, it could be um, kind of a non biased movie, so change could happen hopefully with the film. Um, but getting that access to the other side was really difficult, um, and people just didn't want to talk on camera. Um, however, I did have people who are on both sides. And so I do, um, I have a character who is a major general contractor, does a whole bunch of projects in Texas, worked on the Apple campus, renovation of the Capitol, federal courthouse, and um, total conservative Republican, has photos of him and John Boehner and all the Bushes in his um, office. But this was probably like the first year he voted Democrat because he realized um, that the industry depended on immigrants and um, he didn't want his business to die. Um, and so he, he talks a lot about immigration reform. Um, so in that sense, I just realized that, okay, these people aren't gonna talk to me um, and I'm in the inside already with like one group of people, so I'm just, you know, gonna show that side and show what's happening because it's not being covered. Um, I didn't want to focus so much on being um, bipartisan because um, I had this other character. I think that was plenty, and he's so vocal, and everything that comes out of his mouth is just golden. So it was, it was, <laughs> it was gonna be good um, either way. But um, in doing the short piece, you know. Um, I think um, there's a lot of skepticism, at least in Texas, among the government about independent filmmakers, and I dealt with that going to the Capitol, um, and other filmmakers in, in Austin have dealt with it too, in that, um, you know, uh, to get permission to film on the floor in the Capitol, you need to be associated with a news organization and can't be an independent production company. Um, however, hearings, like Senate hearings, um, um, you, those are open to the public and you can go in there, how, but the Senate has been changing up their rules and it's been confusing the communications liaison as well. Um, and he even admitted that like, he doesn't know what the Senate's doing anymore. And so then you had to have credentials to go in, but then some people snuck, I don't know. It's just like, there's, um, I got pulled over by the Sergeant of Arms when I was trying to film in the hallway and he was just very rude to me. Um, but we have the right to, to film, at least in the hallway. Um, so I think it's just important that filmmakers know um, how much um, access they can have, you know, as filmmakers, as independent journalists, um, especially in like public, public areas. And I guess I also wonder, I want to ask one kind of last question to the group and then open it up a bit, but, you know, do, I agree that we can't all be jumping on the Trump bandwagon. There's lots of stories that need telling, but I do wonder um, how we're supposed to keep up in some ways. So the immigration story is changing really rapidly. Um, you know, any of anything, any number of things can be changing. It's like I, we all wake up every morning and the headlines are like, well, wait, what happened? Especially those of us on the West Coast, like what? So I guess, I guess I'm wondering for you guys, you know, film, filmmaking, independent filmmaking takes a long time and how are you all thinking about, um, you know, to, to delve into things and to commit to things, not really knowing what the future holds, even for your own story in a way? <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> I, I mean, both Brian and myself, we were editing up until the very last second mm -hmm. um, to deal with the the day to day crisis. So when we, you know, and ongoing uh, headline situation. So I, I know that you had the inauguration yeah. uh, in yeah. your film. <laughs> At Sunday, uh, three days after. Three days later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. That was that was remarkable. Um, and <laughs> 
I thought I was I was pretty close with just being a, you know two weeks ahead, and there you were like editing <laughs> while the film was playing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, of course, this is a, a real challenge. Is how do you, um, how do you, especially if you have a story that is uh, something that's taking place in real time or is is um, politically related, mm. when when the situation changes so much, you're like, is Trump even going to be president in a month? You know, <laughs> if I'm building this whole story around him, mm. what's what's the issue that people are really going to care about? Um, and we're supposed to be prognosticators, kind of, and it's really, d I, no one can really predict the future right now. Every day you wake up and there's five things that a documentary could be made about. <laughs> so it's really, really a challenge. And I think it's also important when we talk about uh, Trump. Um, he is, he's just, he's an abnormality. He's, we're, not, <laughs> we're not talking about a traditional Republican here um, or a traditional Democrat. Uh, for the longest time, no one on the Republican side who was um, sort of the traditional media was behind him. The politicians weren't behind him. So, it's, so there's plenty of room for uh, both parties to kind of come together on issues that traditionally we have all held as American values. And I think that that's really the role for the documentary filmmaker going forward when we're trying to deal with Trump is to say, look, we should not normalize him and try to um, you know, figure out ways to justify his positions and say, I, I just don't think we should say, look, this is just another example of, um, you know, sort of the progression of politics and this is normal. It's not normal. Um, and, and the pace at which rights are being taken away right now, I'm afraid of making a documentary and it coming out in a year and a half and it just being way too late. Um, for the documentary to be effective. Maybe there'll be libel laws thrown down before that. Uh, maybe we'll just be stuck in court, like your film shows, um, you know, if we, if, we, uh, <laughs> if we say things that the powers that be, Trump and friends, don't like. Um, so, uh, so I'm deeply concerned about the pace right now at which we need to be working, and I'm also trying to grapple with the, how we um, produce content in a way that can have a more immediate influence. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm, I'm thinking about different ways to do that right now. Um, maybe you do something like a real-time podcast where you're talking about the issues as you're making it and then you're also creating a project in, in real time um, so that you can tackle issues and, and show the discoveries. It, it's just a different way of thinking about things because we normally hold, we often hold as filmmakers uh, our films to our chests because we're afraid of, of, of you know, the possible backlash of a powerful corporation or um, government officials getting ahead of us and then, it, you know, defanging the film. Um, but for me, we really are just in, in, in different times right now, and it, it's, and also the technology plays into that as well, big time. Um, that's that's something that's very different. And one last point is related to the fake news. So fake news, like you, you were saying, it's not, um, it's a it's a dangerous term. Um, there has when it comes to disinformation campaigns, which is really what this is, it's just a new kind of disinformation campaign, those have been going on in America forever. I mean, what, how do we get into the Iraq war? It was a disinformation <laughs> campaign. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's not new. It's just the, the way, the speed at which things are moving and, and how, um, how it's being executed. Um, and, and we have to figure out ways to combat that at, at, ev at an even speed. Yeah, I'd like to add one positive thing here, maybe the only positive thing. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the fact that you, you go into a film and you don't know how it's going to end, um, obviously it makes, it's a real challenge from a filmmaking uh, perspective, but I think audiences see that challenge, yeah. and it's actually exciting to watch mm -hmm. a film where the filmmakers um, aren't clear how it's going to be made. Yeah. I mean, even in, in films where you don't have you know, the filmmaker is subject. I mean, people can still see, how, you know, that this was a real challenge. They can, they, I mean, I think people more and more are understanding how films are made, how documentaries are made. I think there's been a real education mm -hmm. uh, over the last 20 years. And so I, there's an a, element of excitement and urgency that is, becomes part of the film because the filmmaker is exploring how to make, you know, exploring these challenges as they're making the film. How to react film. to things, yeah. I, I think, my take on your question is actually, I think maybe what you were saying earlier, um, you know, just this, um, this sense of detaching yourself somewhat from the news cycle and trying very hard to look at overall trends. Yeah. Um, I've realized I don't, probably won't get, I, I will get excited about it. I won't get excited about a story unless there has some 
I feel some kind of undertow, you know, like something's happening. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not going to end well. <laughs> and uh, so I want to figure it out. And so there's, a, there's an element of just curiosity that's just like, this just doesn't seem right. It seems like maybe there's a historical precedent for this, but there's this new element. How is this going to play itself out? And if you're following those kinds of stories, there's, you can kind of sense that there's things ahead of you. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's what you were saying before, detaching yourself somewhat from the from the, the immediacy of the news cycle and looking at, you know, what has been happening as, you know, progressing in this country over the last 30, 40 years. What are those big trends? Where are the tectonic plates grinding between civil liberties and technology or money and politics and all of that stuff? Where is that tension the greatest? The good stories are right at the heart of that tension where things are the hardest. It sounds like you should make a film about Citizens United. I'm just throwing I it out there. I did make an episode about it. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I no one has really done the kind of seminal Citizens United story, and it's, yeah. it's not maybe going anywhere. Chelsea, it's interesting to listen to you talk about your digital security and the security, you know, getting a lawyer and all these things. And um, do you feel like it, it is, you know, were it not for this climate, would you not have done those things in that way? Um, I, I, Maybe. I mean, now I'm thinking, I mean, surveillance is like a really, uh, I'm very paranoid about <laughs> emails and stuff like that. Um, so um, like thinking about encryption of my emails um, um, is more on my mind now than it probably would have been um, if, if things didn't turn out the way they did. Um, but in, in protecting my sources and, and my characters, um, that has always been, you know, um, on my mind. Um, it's a little different though when you're working or you're featuring people who are like on the front lines because I mean their lives are at risk no matter what even if you don't have a camera. Um, but yeah, I mean there's just little things now that I've, I've thought about more um, because of the political climate. I think that's the, one of the positive things for our industry as journalists, as filmmakers. I think it's, it is going to push us to be as much smarter about the work we do in a way that we should have been doing because Obama was certainly quieter about things, but but no less aggressive. Um, okay, I lied. I have one more question, and then I'm going to open it up. Sorry. Um, so there's been a lot. Of, I've been to a lot of meetings with filmmakers and journalists and lawyers around the country in the last few months, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about speaking across the aisle, and are we reaching audiences who are not already, you know, kind of in agreement with us? And I'm just wondering, you know, and I. Like everything, obviously, like I'm the most ambivalent person you've ever met. I, I have mixed feelings about this. Like some days I, I agree, some days I don't. What do you What do you all think about that? I think about that a lot, um, a lot actually. Um, and I don't, um, you know, to, to some degree, I feel like with a, in a long form like this, you're you're telling a story, right? And if you can engage people in a story, it's a very very powerful. Uh, way of changing minds because once they're invested in characters, you can kind of take them anywhere you want. <laughs> you know, you can. You it gives a, 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 a film as a way for people to try on different uh, ideological viewpoints in a kind of safe way. That's not the kind of pundit pundit clash. Um, I mean, I made this film is about Hulk Hogan, and it makes a very political point. Um, that was there was a reason for that. Um, there's um, there's a there's d decisions that went into distribution, for instance. Um, you know, the how you're going to you know distribute them is: do I want to um, bring this film to art house theaters and crowds, or do I want it? And we made the decision to go with Netflix, actually, which just turns the, turns the film on in 190 countries and mm -hmm. 25 different languages, 93 million viewers all over the world. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a powerful decision to make. It, it there's some drawbacks to it, but there's but if you're if you're trying to reach in a storytelling sense, um, everybody and I certainly am. Um, that's you know there's there's things that there's ways of approaching it that I think uh, that will help that process. Well, there's I mean there's issues that s seem to divide us, and there's things that I think everyone can agree on. Um, I, I I think we all try to approach these things from a nonpartisan perspective, and and find issues that we should all be able to agree on and then just focus on, on that issue and then find characters who, um, it sounds like we've all done this, where you're, you're looking for characters who 
it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. Y you can come, y y you leave some of that at the door uh, when you get caught up in the story. Um, and so, I mean, you know, the, the previous film I tackled digital privacy, and then this film was, um, you know, regulatory corruption. And I think that nobody is, is uh, super cool with those things, um, you know. Uh, and so, so that's finding that commonality, I guess. Um, and, then, and then figuring out how to, uh, to sort of show that this is not a, a partisan problem, um, especially with these kinds of issues. Uh, I mean, you can find Democrats and Republicans in, in powerful positions who care about them. Um, it was like what Kirby was saying earlier, you can go to DC and, and put together a bipartisan panel or, or screening with con congressional members and there's, a, I, there's like a theater underneath the Capitol and you can, you can put together that kind of event if the film itself doesn't feel like it has too much of a, pol like a, a political perspective and bias to it. Um, and it's not very difficult, I think, to do that in a film as long as you just ask questions and let the characters speak for themselves. Um, I'm in, Sonia Childress wrote a really great article um, in medium.com about um, um, moving past building empathy among documentaries and now just building solidarity. Um, so I look at it now and, and maybe because it is um, a new political climate um, that I don't really care about preaching to the choir. I mean, or I do, I'm, I'm fine with preaching to the choir and I think like um, people are gonna see, especially in the business um, industry in my movie, like the effects of the people that I'm showcasing and how it affects them too. So that bipartisanship is just gonna come naturally. Um, and I did that on purpose because I did want to show a point of view of workers um, that people hadn't seen before. You know, you see construction and you just know that there are brown people working on there, but you don't, you never, you don't know who they are or where they've come from. And I specifically chose to um, just center it around them. Um, but I think it also like affects the impact of the documentary as well. And so just building solidarity with my film already in the groups and the people who are um, on the side of immigrants, I think will make that side even stronger to then push for more action. Um, so I'm not like too interested with like trying to um, reach people on the other side because I think it will like come naturally because the the point of view of my characters will be you know really strong do we did, can anybody tell me what time it is okay let's open it for questions just to make sure we have enough time yeah uh, thank you my name is Jonathan I have a question we had the opportunity in this country to elect I, I believe a truly honest politician Bernie Sanders and I went to one of his rallies and I saw a groundswell of, of the youth of America come forward and be excited and energized and there's a saying I don't know if it's it, I'm paraphrasing that that we deserve the the politicians that we have and I just wonder is that the truth I'd like to direct it to, to Kirby <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's a big question. Um, well, one thing I think we should be careful of is denigrating politicians too much. Um, I mean, they are the only people between, uh, the, you know, the, the people and corporate power, right? They're the only people there. So I think when you see this continual attack on politicians, even if politicians do, you know, just, you know, this attack on politicians and, you know, they have the lowest, I think the, the lowest sort of positive rating of just about any group, that actually hurts uh, politicians who are there, even if they don't do it, they're the only people there to sort of, you know, regulate, offer this protection. So I think it's, it's important to not get caught up in that. Um, do we deserve the, I, I, I think we do actually. I mean, that's what a democracy is. I mean, obviously there's, you, in a democracy, there's no such thing as a pure democracy. You're all, always dealing with um, moneyed forces. I mean, that's, that's going to be in the mix. Now, obviously, is that fair? No, I mean, uh, you know, people with money have more power. But, but we do have a democracy, and I think, um, you know, and I think Bernie Sanders is a good example. I mean, when you have people coming out and, um, and, and, you know, in these kind of rallies and, and this kind of support, 
that does make a difference. And even though Bernie Sanders wasn't elected, I think he, uh, he and his supporters have, have had and will continue to have a huge impact on politics. I don't know if we have a democracy or not. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't know that it's gotten to the point where we can trust the system in terms of the amount of money and everything that's in the system right now. So I think there has to be some real systemic change before there is there is that notion of a representative democracy. And I think information and everything plays into that. Well, okay. So I'm going to take issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only system we have to trust. Okay. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Is it, is it flawed? Immensely so. Has it be become more flawed? Yes. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, uh, you know, w comparatively, we have a, you know, a relatively good democracy compared to, you know, just historically and just looking Had around it? the world. I mean, we do. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it may yeah. not look uh, right. it may not look like it right now, but um, it could it could be much much worse. And I think I mean I think that's one of the things that we were saying here. And so, right. it's I think it's important. Yes, you can you you can criticize it. You can uh, um, uh, you know there's a lot to criticize about it. But we do have a democracy here. This is this is what democracy is. I mean. It's, but democracy is not this ideal. I mean, it's an ideal, but in reality, it's a messy, dirty, I mean, it's, and, it, and, and nothing is, you know, it's, even if you fight and, and rights are achieved, that fight goes on. You, you, you know, there's continual, you know, backsliding and moving forward, so. Yeah. Um. It's messy. <laughs> it, democracy is messy when it works well, uh, but I think that, and, and maybe there's, the, the mechanics or the skeleton of a system is still in place and we can be proud of that for sure. Uh, but that system is being eroded around the edges in ways that's sure. undeniable and yeah, needs to be stopped and I think does, um, does interfere with true grassroots kind of movement and, and a citizen's right to a representative democracy. Right. I think we're seeing an erosion of that in a very big way and yes. disturbing way. 538 um, did a really interesting analysis of the the kind of the, the the pressure and the events that actually moved the needle in the Trump administration. And I'm just mm. going to throw it out there because it kind of it's good food for thought. So the bureaucracy, the unappointed people working within the federal government, the courts, Democrats in Congress, the public, especially people who are organizing as citizens, the media, and then Republicans in Congress. And so they did this analysis, and I was going to throw it up there, but it was too complicated. Of um, you know, if two of those events happen, how much does it push the needle? If three of those things happen, if four of those things happen, and so I think in some ways, like, that's democracy. All those things working together to really try to create a society that's, that's for all and that's for the betterment of all. And I have a lot of hope in those young people who were Bernie supporters. I believe they will save us because I don't think they want this bullshit partisanship that we're dealing with. Questions over there. I know I saw someone right all the way to yeah. the right. Oh, okay, sorry, you have the mic, go for okay. it. Um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about the issues that you have brought up today in light of Standing Rock and the journalism and the models of journalism that were used there from drone uh, documentaries, the, the impact of that, um, digital smoke signals was just so enlightening to me. They just won the, uh, the digital, um, Film Festival in New York City, they won first prize for that. And what I saw happening there was that they didn't wait for, uh, you know, into the regular media, because the regular media didn't come in except for uh, Democracy Now! in the very beginning, and then it was like quiet. Mm -hmm. So it was like independent media, Fusion and Unicorn Ryan and AJ and all of that was jumping in, as well as live streaming that was then being used, that content, to make these short little videos that went out. So I'm just really curious about you know, the, the issues that you've, you've raised about long-term investigative journalism in making documentaries and the way that something that now became a global focus um, because of the different kinds of media, how, and, and now the documentaries are being made, it's kind of like, the longer ones are in production mm -hmm. after the event. So just, I would love to hear your comments and your reflections about that process. Because a, a key mantra constantly was, we are the media, we are the media, we are the media. And I think a lot of people took that to heart. You know, so I'd just love to hear your reflections on that experience. 
Chelsea, do you, I'm wondering if you have something to say given that you're doing this long, long-term long project, but then you also just turned around this very quick short for the first 100 days. Yeah, um, uh, Who's Streets last night, I just got to see it for the uh, yeah. first time, did such a brilliant job at incorporating, um, well, Lucas was here the other yesterday talking too about, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just <laughs> like, the movie was great, by the way. Um, <laughs> It was so great to see um, the participants of the film actually participate like in the process and have um, their footage from their phones, from their cameras, um, um, as the main like storytelling um, thread, you know. Um, and I have encountered that also with um, the young people of immigrants who are um, U.S. born citizens, you know, um, who have gained a lot of responsibility because they have to communicate um, for their parents and learn about things and fight for them and stand up. And they film everything on their phone. <laughs> um, and it's amazing because um, if I'm stalled in funding <laughs> for my film, I can at least um, work with the characters and collaborate with them in sharing that footage and that being a main part of the story as well. And um, yeah, and then just the live streaming too. I mean, sometimes it gets a little overwhelming and I have to take a break from Facebook a little bit because <laughs> like, you know, something new is happening, you know, all the time. But um, that's also it really exciting and that's where the solidarity just like begins to build um, much more tighter. P people forget like, you know, the, the media is represents the people mm -hmm. right and that's that's what it's for I mean we have if you look around the if you look at if you talk to people who look for democracies around the world um, functioning democracies what are they looking for right they're looking for a uh, independent judiciary um, free and fair elections and, a, and an independent <laughs> press and these are the things that Trump is attacking judiciary <laughs> uh, elections and the press and uh, so this is, this is something that we have to, and if you look at these poll numbers, like the media is hated more than anybody else. There has to be this kind of reawakening to the fact that the fourth estate is something that stands up for the rights of individual citizens. And I think you see that in, in, Citizen, uh, in Standing Rock. How, how many filmmakers are in the audience? I'm just curious. Okay, so, so not that many. So I'm just, then I have another question. How many of you um, documentary lovers out there view documentary film as the media? Do you see a distinction? You know, yes, I view it as the media. Who does? Yeah. As part of the media. Do you see it as media or as press? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who doesn't see it as media or as press? You know, raise your hand real high. It's really interesting. So you guys are ambivalent, right? There's an ambivalence about whether or not documentary filmmakers are part of the media. What do you guys have to say about this? The media is a big, big broad you know, term. That means almost uh, almost is meaningless. It's like hacker or something. Or fake but media. it's not meaningless. I mean, it can't be meaningless for it, our it democratic kind of is. It's purposes. It's so broad and so vague. It means social media. It means Breitbart. It means um, media. 60 Minutes. It means, you know, it, it's... It's, it's so broad uh, that it's very, very difficult. It means madmen, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 you know, I think, I think um, we live in a highly mediated world right now, so the, it's a more specific conversation than just the media. And it's, it's interesting. I think documentaries over the last 20 years um, have been able, I mean, when you speak of the corporate media, they've been able to come from the outside of that. And I think, um, I think that's given, I mean, I completely think that they're part of the media, but it's, it's uh, one of the things that's interesting is that I think to get a viewpoint, even in, you know, to something like the New York Times, I mean, there's so many doors that you have to go through. It takes a long time just to get that point of view, you know, to, in front of these editors to, and, and to actually embrace that. So that's one of the interesting things about documentary films is that, you know, a film like yourself, like yours can be developed over a long period of time and then it, it lands and the perspective is already there directly and particularly with Netflix directly with the audience and I think that's uh, you know one of the another positive thing I think that's <laughs> happened in the last 20 years. Yeah. Well, well documentaries um, they can do something different than the media can do and I think this speaks back to what we were talking about earlier where you know we don't have to be reactive every week um, that's that's the 
kind of the, the gift of making a documentary is we get to be meditative. Um, and then we get to look at everything that's happened over a period of time, connect dots, and then do what media, I think, when we generally think of it, cannot, which is uh, show the bigger picture um, and, and show it in a way that isn't just caught up in an emotional frenzy. So uh, are we a part of the media? Yeah, I mean, like Brian said, mm, what's the media? But, um, but certainly we play a different role, uh, I think, and, and I think it's an increasingly more important role. Um, I, I think it's always been important, but I think that people are now, as Kirby said earlier, political documentaries were, were not really uh, considered uh, as, as sort of high art um, in the documentary space for some time, and, and I do see that that's changing now, and I'm grateful for that. Um, they've always been important, uh, but, but I think now, like with the issue of digital privacy, we're, we're realizing that these civil liberties issues are things we always have to fight for. Thank you for your courage. Documentaries are often the tipping point because you filmmakers go where angels fear to tread <laughs> <laughs> and step on people's toes. Um, I have a comment and then a couple of questions. First of all, I'm a deep ecology researcher and MIT has said that we're using up oxygen five times faster than we are producing it. Within the past two or three days, Trump has signed to um, let the underground water aquifer mm. under the Mojave Desert be farmed for the LA Basin to use. And um, it's common knowledge that we have now used up two-thirds of America's topsoil. It's now dead due to big agriculture. But what is concerning me the most is this idea that things have so accelerated in America that we, the people, have not recognized what the European people have recognized. And I recently went to hear a speaker who is a guest speaker at SOU, invited by the United Nations Club to come from Berlin, Germany. And he said that in Germany and in Europe, they're not comparing Trump to Hitler. They are saying he is like Mussolini because Mussolini defined fascism as the marriage between government and corporations. So in terms of Citizens United, um, I have a friend who lives in Talent who is from Austria. Austria is a neutral country. They didn't even join NATO, but her emissary or her consulate called her because he said, be ready to leave America on a moment's notice. Now what this man from Berlin said is that the European Union has become a military superpower in their own right. And even the day that Merkel was talking to Trump, the European Union, he said, was deciding where their headquarters for their military super power was going to be located, and they were under discussion of developing a nuclear bomb as a European Union. So my question is, what would it take for all of you to have solidarity together as filmmakers to address this whole idea when they are in Austria? a neutral country calling Trump the orange-haired Mussolini, I think world history needs to be taken in view, and all of you do need to address what angels fear to tread. Is America trending toward fascism? Well, I, I, because like if it is, I like the kind of if, if it is, we have uh -huh. lost democracy. Uh -huh. 
There's, um, there's a quote from Hannah Arendt that uh, was, it's in the origins of totalitarianism, and it, it's that uh, one of the key tenets is convincing us that anything is possible, but nothing is true. Uh, and, and it takes a little bit of time to wrap one's head around it, but, but that's, it's, it's like Trump being able to say in one breath, we don't need regulations, and in the next, we can have clean air and clean water. Um, it'll be crystal clean. So, uh, <laughs> the best it, water. Yeah, ever. the best. No, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best. <laughs> Any other water is just sad. So yeah, I mean the problem. It's it, it's not a new problem that we're dealing with here. It's just in a different form, uh, and that's how it always seems to come. Is is that people say, well, somehow uh, this is something. We're not dealing with something new uh, here, um, a as you mentioned, and and all. And history is our is our guide uh, when it comes to. Uh, looking at, at trends that have led in, led people into a kind of totalitarian state, and that's why I think that we're in a in a in a rush here, in a way, um, bef before uh, too many rights are, are taken from us. That uh, are, uh, it'll be hard for us to g even do the the work we're we're trying to do. Right. So, more questions. Oh, there's several. So I'm going to try I'm going to try to make sure that we we get across. Why don't we maybe come over here? So I feel like the side of the room. And if you could ask your question, that would be great, just because I think we're going to run out of time before most of you um, get yeah. to speak. Thank you. I have a practical question. First of all, thank you for what, for what you're doing. Um, because things are moving at such a rapid pace, um, it's very difficult to raise money fast enough yeah. to start your film unless you're doing it all on your own, unless you, know, you have your own camera, you're filming, you're, you know, you're doing it all. It's like, I, I know that Field Division is giving some money. I know ITVS is doing, there's some rapid, funds, but they're very small. And so I'm just curious in terms of, you know, you have an I, I have an idea, I want to do it, but I don't have the money to do it myself, and where can I get that money so quickly to make a difference in a, in a, in, in the, in a time period where it's going to make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> Brian says that's for me. This is actually, <laughs> this is a big problem, and it's something that I'm deeply, deeply concerned with in terms of the independent world, which is we don't have rapid response funds. You know, fun, we do have money, but it can take a long time to, to dole out. And so what happens when Standing Rock is unfolding? You know, where is the fun to get a couple of filmmakers out there? Uh, so it's all, the best I can say right now is this is something that's being widely talked about and widely recognized as an issue. It's something that I'm thinking about with the Enterprise Fund. We can't do it with the big production fund. We might be able to do it with some development funding. And, um, and, and it may be the best place for it, actually. So we are working on it is the best thing I can say, but it is a big problem. On the flip side, I, you know, as I've been listening to all of you today, I did start to think like, well, we're always complaining about money. We never have enough money. We don't have big business behind us. Like maybe that's what keeps us honest <laughs> in a certain way. Like maybe there's something to, no, seriously, there's something to be said for that because if, you know, if all the deep pockets were throwing us a couple million dollars here and there, we would be telling the stories they want us to tell. And that, that tension is somewhat important for our independence. It, it is what keeps us independent. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I, I just like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really, really true. Uh, the other thing is, I would say start shooting. Yeah. I would just start shooting with your iPhone. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Just whatever you can do, start shooting. Um, because um, not only will that footage, you know, sort of in the sort of an arc of a film, that early footage often becomes really essential to creating a, an overall narrative. But also, you start, you start formulating your idea. Once you're shooting and once you're thinking about how you, you're going to cut it, you already start, you know, your, your approach becomes deeper and it becomes easier to sell the project. And then, <coughs> I don't think you even need necessarily to, you know, create a trailer, which can take a lot of time and money sometimes. I mean, you can just show excerpts and just yeah. say, this is an example of where we're kind of going. Mm -hmm. And that excites funders. That's such good advice. <laughs> Yeah. And there's a momentum that's built just from jumping yeah. in, and tools are sometimes cheap, or uh, now cheap enough where you can kind of do some early, early work. Yeah. So what I did with my um, feature that's in post production right now is um, I looked at the organizations that were fighting for workers and for unions and labor groups, and saw who funded them, 
as far as like foundations and that was really helpful in me getting on board with Ford Foundation and they ended up giving me like a small grant to cover travel um, and then and, and then Just Films ended up like um, supporting me which led to more funding. Um, but that's a way to connect with um, foundations who are in like SOS mode at the time also who wanna help um, people tell these stories and point of views and then you're not actually getting funding from the organization maybe you're filming or something so there's no conflict of interest but you're going through um, a foundation kind of route and and sometimes that can be a semi quick turnaround to get funding from them that's true that's a good point yeah hi this is a question about access um, I know some of us who are doing these kinds of documentaries of activists getting it into the hands of people at least to view that are not going to avail themselves of the uh, media that maybe some of our films if it's on public broadcasting or our, our film festivals where it's, it's definitely a more activist, a left leaning. How, any comments on how do we get people in the middle of the country when we've traveled and we have relatives that never avail themselves of positions that th those of us maybe seek out? The National Public Radios, the Oregon Public Broadcasting type of places. So how, how do we get the word out to other than the choir? I know, Kelsey, you mentioned that we don't mind talking to choir, but somewhere we have to influence just like the media they listen to is totally influencing them. Well, I went on Glenn Beck the other day. <laughs> you <So>. did? <laughs> <laughs> that's smart. And, and what happened? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's y you sit in a room and you find where you have common ground. And, you, uh, and then you try and talk about the issues that way. So the only way to reach, um, that, uh, the, I think, the group you're referring to is, is to go to the outlets they listen to. Um, so that was... I'm always excited when uh, when uh, when an outlet like that um, reaches out, and also it's been interesting as well to see uh, a, a, a I mean, like you said, a common enemy before. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, 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 a when I was there, I saw a thoughtfulness that I didn't anticipate, and we really um, we really did manage to find some common ground. So I think that that's it's not necessarily a way to to get your documentary completely out there, but you can talk about your your projects and maybe get people who. Uh, don't watch the PBSs of the, you know, or, or listen to NPR to uh, seek out your film. Yeah, I think we have to we have to make a act, you know, effort to to uh, to talk to people who disagree with us. That uh, makes our lives more interesting. <laughs> it makes it good for politics. It's good for storytelling, um, including people in your documentaries that you disagree with. That's where things actually kind of start to get interesting. Um, yeah, you have to move into that sphere un unflinching and, and, and having a point and understanding that people are going to have different points than you. Um, one thing that I'm uh, concerned about, or at least always kind of aware of, is technology and the way that it's play it plays a role in this. Um, the algorithms of Facebook and stuff, I think, are working against this in a very strong way. Um, you know, uh, they say they, well, first of all, you don't know what you don't know what your news feed is, because nobody does. Nobody knows why certain stories are pushed to the top and others are pushed down. We don't know that. That's their secret sauce. They're not telling us. Um, but what that does is it, it pushes us into our own ideological corners. So um, you know these kind of platforms in which we communicate sometimes nudge us in certain directions. And I think that's, it's important to be aware of that and, and counter it and fight it a little bit. Yeah, I think the that your outreach strategy is really important um, with the film. Um, something that I've been learning um, in the process of making my film is how the film will be an Im make an impact, um, and so thinking about like what organizations I can partner with um, that can use my film as a tool to go into um, the Midwest, um, go into the South and bring the, the film to um, really small communities. Um, but if you can partner with organizations, then they can um, help fund you know, a theater screening and bring people out um, or have an outdoor screening. But I think um, the grassroots um, field of of getting your film out there is going to be like the most important thing um, to make have your film make a really strong impact. Yeah, I was wondering if if any of you are working to get your your documentaries into schools. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
Kirby, I think you should answer that one. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> I, I, uh, <laughs> I think you know the answer to this, but um, uh, the, the last film that I made, The Hunting Ground, about rape on college campuses, um, one of the reasons I made it was that I knew uh, that there was going to be a very robust college screening you know, and in fact, we've gone to more than a thousand colleges w with our film, and and every time the f every time the film plays on a college campus, it it starts its own sort of activism. I mean, or I should say, the activism is actually there. It's actually there. It, it but once once a film comes in and it has this kind of prominence and it brings in other right. people who maybe aren't activists, they, it, it creates a, a momentum on that campus and it starts to. Uh, starts to pressure the administration, which up in, you know, in most cases is not addressing this at all. So that, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of The Hunting Ground, I mean, it was, it was really important. Likewise with The Invisible War um, as well. But uh, there's, I'm sure you all had. No, I, yeah, I think it's really, I think it's critical. Um, my previous film uh, was called The Internet's Own Boy. Um, and we spent, I mean, I spent most of the fall of 2000. 15, I, I think, just touring colleges and um, and talking with people. And I agree, a lot of the energy and stuff is already there, and a film is a very useful tool for sort of getting people in the same room and starting talking, and then those things kind of grow. And um, So uh, it's, it's a really big, big deal. And I think you, I think um, there is something also about just a f like an in-person screening um, that, that that cha that changes that dynamic where people can meet and, and there's a there's a there's a real life presence. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the back. I'm interested in getting your viewpoint on the evolution of what news has become. Mm -hmm. um, the distinction between fake news, false reporting, investigative journalism, analysis, opinion. We used to be able to open up a newspaper, right. and there was an opinion page. A lot of us don't process our news that way anymore. We process it digitally. And it seems, it, it, it seems in my lifetime that we used to know that the National Enquirer was fake news. Um, there wasn't a politici politicization of this channel is left-leaning versus this channel is right-leaning. And now everything is framed in that manner versus we're reporting the facts. Yeah. And there was a point where, it, again, in my perspective, we weren't getting news anymore. We were getting the analysis of what happened versus what happened. So how do you see that? We, we live in a complicated world right yeah. now it, <laughs> when yeah. it comes to news and journalism and, getting, and especially getting the truth, right? Um, you know, there's multiple things happening. I mean, we talked a little bit about at least my, my take on big money funding some of these really uh, super partisan outside political groups that are funding and fueling some of those, some of those that what we would call fake news, um, especially the crazy stuff with the Pizza Gate and the, and the, um, the po you know, the Pope uh, um, endorsing Donald Trump and things like that. We have that going on. Um, in a world at post Citizens United, and we also have a world in which um, traditional investigative j journalism has lost m most of its major sources of income. I mean, we're talking about huge gobs of income year over year uh, for a while now. It's lost some of that, which is advertising to the internet. Mm -hmm. So we have this new model for what we think of as inv investigative journalism um, struggling to be born, uh, at, and it's not quite there yet and it's being attacked by our president and by lots of other force, very, very powerful forces. So this is a delicate period of time. We also have, um, it's a period of technology in which a lot of our um, personal and private information and correspondence um, or the, that of powerful people can be hacked and, and, and manipulated. Um, I think that was clearly a part of this last campaign um, where, where uh, political groups were hacked and leaks were made to uh, strategically embarrass um, you know, political opponents, that's part of the news. That's part of what we see. That's part of the information we absorb when we're trying to make a political decision, right? This is, this is a chaotic world in which there are, um, uh, there's a classic Marshall McLuhan quote that says, uh, where he says that uh, the guerrilla, uh, the, uh, World War III will be a guerrilla information war in which there is no separation between 
civilian and state actors. And it seems to me a pretty good description of this moment when you have state actors, you know, uh, hacking uh, DNC. They, of course, they didn't just hack the DNC, they hacked RNC and others too. But, uh, but also selectively uh, trying to influence mm -hmm. public opinion by strategic leaking of that information. Um, it, you have, that's one player. Uh, WikiLeaks is a player. Um, New York Times is a player. Um, Government Accountability Project, funded by Robert Mercer and Breitbart is a player. Uh, so so we're in, a, we're in a, a, a new place where media literacy and understanding these dynamics is becoming critical. I think, to me, it's about um, teaching that media literacy at every level, kids in school, uh, uh, teaching this information environment to, to kids. But it's also about supporting um, with money um, people that you think are, are behaving well. Yeah, and I, I, I think there is a resurgence. I mean, I feel, I feel a little more optimistic actually right now than I did a few months ago, looking at all the money and support. You know, the New York Times subscriptions went through the roof. Um, nonprofit independent news organizations like ProPublica have had a windfall. They're hiring people all over the country. They used to be based just on uh, in New York and in California, and now they're able to open new bureaus. I mean, th there's a long history to all of this, just like the redistrict redistricting, which is that in the 80s there was deregulation. And we used to have a fairness doctrine, and there used to be regulation over um, uh, you know, radio stations and monopolies and things like that. And so I think this has been a long march to this point that's not just about technology, um, but it's also about our regulatory uh, system. And so I, I feel, I actually feel a little bit optimistic. I think people want real information, regardless of what your political beliefs are. I actually believe that American citizens want good information, and it's just a matter of access. I mean, we all grew up in a time where you had, most of us had a, a newspaper from our local, you know, city or county thrown on our doorstep, and we all knew what was going on, and those things were obliterated by the internet. Those regional news organizations were obliterated. So we have a different relationship to, to the news now as citizens, and I, I feel like we're recognizing that and that I hope there will be a correction. I think we're seeing one. Well, the, the disinformation campaigns that are being run, one of the primary dif differences is that it's being run by a foreign actor. So we have 15,000 plus sources that are generating content on the internet to, uh, to make it very difficult to find uh, what is actually factual and what is not. And that's amplified by what Brian was talking about earlier, where we have these news feeds that are, that are tailored to our interests. Now, we're experiencing the long tail of the corporate surveillance machine. Um, because all of that information we've been giving up online, the thousands of data points that have been collected, were applied for the first time in this election. So not only were they using, there's a firm called Cambridge Analytica that not only was hired for the Brexit campaign, but was hired in, in, uh, by the Trump campaign. And this firm used what they claim to, what they say is 5,000 data points on the average American citizen to uh, build psychometric profiles. And these are extremely uh, tailored profiles where they can, I mean, they know you better than you know yourself, and that's always been the goal. And, and so they can use that then to, to tip you in your, with your news, uh, on your news feed, you know, get you to maybe not vote if, uh, if you were gonna vote for Hillary Clinton, or maybe tip you in the direction of Trump by feeding you this, this information. So it's gone beyond our inability to just find the truth. We're actually being overtly fed uh, lies um, from the in as a result of uh, the misuse of information that we've given over the years. Uh, the lies that are tailored to us. So it's a, it's, uh, that to me is just one of, the, one of the biggest things we have to figure out how to fight against. Yeah, I mean, I would, ag I would agree. I mean, I think this is uh, what you're bringing up, Colin, is extremely important. And it's, it's obviously going to develop um, over the next few years. And it's really important for everyone to sort of uh, to try to understand this and see what we can do about it. I think also we have to realize that there was no golden age either in some ways. I mean, all, all news has a political perspective. And I think it, it, in, it can get a little bit dangerous when some news organizations say we have a purely objective perspective. That's one of the reasons documentaries came up, because those perspectives weren't being heard. Mm -hmm. And so documentaries were able to sort of circumvent that and come up. So we're always in a political world. 
can, can someone let me know what time it is? We're at time. We're at time. Thank you so much to our panelists, to you all. I hope you have a great festival. Thank you, Ashley.